guys, so this is the NCLEX RN 2019 ATI Comprehensive Review Series. So this is section 4C, the third part of section 4, in which I will talk about pharmacology. Gastrointestinal medication, which in short we say GI medication. So it includes antacids, anti-secretory blocking agents, mucosal protectants, antiemetics, antidiarrheals, and stool softeners, which is laxatives. And acids. So these include aluminum hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, and sodium bicarbonate. So what antacids do, they neutralize gastric acid and inactivate pepsin. Some uses for this is for peptic ulcers and for GERD. Some side effects. So aluminum hydroxide has constipation and too little phosphates. Magnesium hydroxide has diarrhea and renal impairment and too much magnesium. And sodium bicarbonate has constipation. So if you just think about it, magnesium could also be used as a laxative. So a side effect, if you have too much, it'll cause diarrhea and hypermagnesium. And you should just know that antacids has constipation. So like aluminum and the sodium bicarbonate both have constipation. Some other stuff you should know that you should take them one hour before, one hour after other medications. And don't take them for more than two weeks. Anti-secretory blocking agents. So these have two groups under that. So it's PPI and H2 blocker. So PPI stands for proton pump inhibitor. And H2 blocker stands for histamine 2 receptor antagonist. So basically what they do is that they prevent and block selected receptors within the stomach. So for PPI, they all end in prazole, omeprazole, lansoprazole, etc. The side effects for this is that it increases the risk for osteoporosis and pneumonia in COPD patients. A hint to remember this is that PPI starts with P, has two P's actually, and they all end in prazole, which also starts with a P. Then we go on to H2 blockers, so they all end in tidine, so rantidine, thymotidian, etc. A hint to remember this is dine, so you dine with two people, so H2, you need two people to dine. Uses are just like the other one, ulcers and GERD, obviously stomach ulcers. Other stuff that you should know, don't use it during lactation, and caution with COPD patients, like we said before, it increases the risk for pneumonia. Mucosal protectants. So this is only one medication that we have to know, sucrophate. Its uses are just like all the other GI medications for ulcers and GERD. You want to pre-question with renal failure, and you should just know that you should give it on an empty stomach one hour before meals and 30 minutes apart from an antacid. What it does is that it sticks to the ulcers upon contact with gastric acid, and it protects it for six hours, and it does not have a systemic effect. So antiemetics, I would know these because you're going to see them a lot. So uses are post-op or chemotherapy or nausea and vomiting related to any disease. So the medications for this group is promethazine, metoclopramide, clindasterone, and scopolamide. What these all have in common is that they all have anticholinergic effects. So I would memorize what anticholinergic effects are because a lot of medications have anticholinergic effects. So a hint to remember this, like I said before, can P, can C, can spit, and can shit. So can P stands for urinary retention, can C stands for blurred vision, can't spit, can't stands for dry mouth, and can't shit stands for constipation. What you also see with antiemetics are EPS symptoms, except for the last one, scopolamide, which is actually a patch. But um, EPS symptoms, I'm going to go into more detail when it comes to antipsychotic medications, but it's muscle and movement control disorders. And one last point, with all these medications, you want to have a precaution when given to someone with cardiac disease. And for the patch, you want to apply it behind the ear. Antidiarrheal, it's to treat diarrhea. What they do is they activate the opioid receptors in GI tracts and they decrease motility, which is the movement, so there's less movement, and increase absorption of fluids and sodium in the intestines. The medications are diphenoxylate plus atrophine, loperamide, and parigot. I would know the loperamide because that you see a lot. So some side effects, exactly like the anticholinergic side effects, constipation, drowsiness, dry mouth, and blurred vision. So I had to remember that, like I said before, can see, can pee, can shit, and can spit. Contraindications are patients with COPD and IBS. Other stuff you should know is that you should monitor the fluids and electrolytes, and you should avoid caffeine because caffeine increases GI motility. Stool softeners and laxatives. What they do is that they facilitate peristalsis and bowel movement. So it's the opposite of, like we said before, antidiarrheals. Pasylum, daxusate, sodium, bisacodyl, and magnesium hydroxide. So they all are laxative in different ways. Like the first one, pasylum, decreases diarrhea, so it's a bulk forming. Daxusate, sodium, it relieves constipation. Bisacodyl is a stimulant, and magnesium, it's an osmotic. But you don't really have to know exactly those, just know that they're all used for laxatives. So some side effects are fluid and electrolyte imbalance, GI irritation, hypermagnesium, and fluid retention. If you just think about what it, what it does, it makes sense that these are the side effects. It's going to be contraindicated with patients that you do not want to move stuff in their GI and bowel. So diverticulitis, because you have alpouchine, 
ulcerative colitis, fecal impaction, bowel obstruction, acute surgical abdominal. Other stuff you should know, you want to promote regular exercise, regular bowel elimination. You want to monitor for abuse because laxatives could also help people lose weight, so people tend to abuse this, and you want to increase fluids and fibers. Here are the classes of the urinary system medications. So this includes diuretics, osmotic diuretics, alpha-adrenergic blockers, anticholinergic, and sexual dysfunction. Diuretics. These include loop, thiazide, and potassium sparing. So loop includes furosemide, umetanide, and thiazide includes hydrochlorothiazide and chlorothiazide. As you can see, they all end in thiazide, so that one's easy. So the side effects of both those groups are hypovolemia, hypokalemia, hyperglycemia, and it could cause digoxin and lithium toxicity, and for loop specifically, odor toxicity. So it's very easy to remember if you just actually think of what it's doing. So diuretics is basically making you pee out all the fluid. So you're going to have less valium, hypovolemia, you could have hypokalemia because it's going to cause potassium to go out also. And a risk factor for lithium and digoxin toxicity is dehydration, which could be caused when you're eating everything out. Then you go on to potassium sparing. So these are also diuretics, but they do not cause hypokalemia. So these include spironolactone and trimethyrin. And the side effects are hyperkalemia because it's keeping in the potassium and endocrine effects like erectile dysfunction or menstrual irregularity. So its uses are for pulmonary edema. And hypertension. So for pulmonary edema, think heart failure. And other stuff you should know, you want to take the INOs, vitals, fluids, and electrolyte imbalance. You want to give in the morning because you don't want to keep waking up at night in pain. You want to increase potassium-rich foods for loop and thiazide. And you want to avoid potassium foods for potassium sparing. I would just remember the main potassium-rich foods are like bananas and potatoes, etc. And you want to avoid potassium foods. And you should just know that they like to test on this. Salt substitutes have potassium in them. You want to avoid them. Asthmatic diuretics, so this includes mannitol. What it does is that it pulls fluid into the vascular and extravascular space by increasing serum asmolarity. Its uses are for renal failure and to decrease intracranial pressure and to decrease intraocular pressure. You want to have precaution with a patient with heart failure. Some side effects are pulmonary edema, fluid and electrolyte imbalance, thirst, and dry mouth. Other stuff you should know, you want to monitor weight, INOs, electrolytes, hypovolemia signs, and neurostatus. I would know that this medication is used for intracranial pressure and for intraocular pressure. Alpha-adrenergic blockers for urinary hesitancy. So this includes tamsulosin and bethanethyl. Tamsulosin, what it does is that it stops the smooth muscle contraction in the prostate, so it improves the rate of urine flow for someone with BPH. Some side effects are decreased libido, headache, dizziness, orthostatic hypertension. Precaution, you have to rule out bladder cancer first, and you want to be precautioned with other hypotensive medications. Like other tips, I just take 30 minutes before the meal and at the same time. And then the next one, bethanechol, what it does is that it increases muscle tone to allow strong start to avoid for post-op urinary hesitancy. And some side effects are excessive saliva, ab cramps, diarrhea, and bradycardia. You want to precaution not for patients with urinary tract obstruction or hypertension or decreased cardiac output. And you want to give it on an empty stomach. Anticholinergic medications for overactive bladder. So these are antispasmodic. So basically they decrease the muscle spasm and contractions. Some medications include oxybutynin, tolotiridine, other ones I've never really seen on the test. Its uses are for urinary incontinence, urinary urgency, and frequency. You want to have precaution with someone with intestinal obstruction, not with other anticholinergic medications, and there's a risk for older adults with cognitive impairment. Some side effects are anticholinergic effects, like we said before, the mnemonic can't see, can't pee, can't shit, and can't spit. So that means blurred vision, constipation, that whole thing, and drowsiness and dyspepsia, which is indigestion. Sexual dysfunction. So basically what the, it's doing is that it's relaxing the penis muscle to allow increased blood flow to produce an erection. Medications in this category include sildenafil, tadetafil, vardenafil. A hint to remember this is fill. You want it to like fill up with blood. Uses are erectile dysfunction, like we said. It's contraindicated with patients who take nitrate medication. You should know that because they both cause hypotension. It's also contraindicated with alpha blockers, antihypertensives, or patients with a history of stroke or uncontrolled diabetes or hypo slash hypertension or heart failure because basically anything that could cause hypotension it's contraindicated with some side effects are hypertension like we said a prism which is an erection lasting for more than four hours which you would go to the emergency room for and vision impairment which you would report hearing loss headache and flushing um other stuff you should know you want to take an hour before sexual activity and you want to take only once daily 
our immune system medications, we're going to talk about immunization and antimicrobial. Okay, immunizations. So we should know that all of them could cause a fever or like that type of side effect and anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is something that would be dangerous, that would require attention and a fever wouldn't. You should know what ages you have to take them and what the vaccine is for. I would not know the side effect or contraindications because they don't test on that. Except for just know that don't have eggs. If you allergic to eggs, don't have the influenza or MMR or ask before to see if there's another one. And you should also know which ones are safe in pregnancy. So in pregnancy, you only want to have the inactive ones. So you're allowed to have influenza, pneumococcal, Tdap, diphtheria, and pertussis. So basically, just not the MMRV. So not the measles, mumps, rubella, and not varicella. You should also know that if you're sick or you have a fever, come back when you feel better. So if you look at all the immunizations, a lot of them are just like the name says, the rotavirus. It's to protect you against the rotavirus. I'm just going to say the ones that are not so obvious. So MMR stands for measles, mumps, rubella, and Tdap is diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, which is the whooping cough, and IPV is against polio, and influenza is the flu. Immunizations. So here's the immunizations that you have to give from birth until six years old. The mnemonics that I made up, if this doesn't help you, you could just skip this slide. At two, four, six, you're giving the same exact immunizations, except for at four months, you're not giving hep B. And at birth, you're giving only hep B. So B equals D, so birth equals hep B. And at four, you're gonna just not include hep B. And then at two and four and six months, you're giving the same thing. So those immunizations are Tdap, RV, which is the rotavirus, Hib vaccine, PCV, which is pneumococcal, hep B, and polio. So a mnemonic that I use is Dr. HP2. Dr. HP2, so the doctor stands for Tdap and rotavirus, the HB stands for Hib and PCV, and then 2 stands for because it's times 2, because there's two of them, and then HP and polio. So there's two H's, two P's, and the doctor stands for Tdap and rotavirus. At 12 to 18 months, you're going to have to give the MMR, so just remember MMR, because at, at one year you're like, hmm, maybe they're growing too fast, or maybe they're impossible. <laughs> and then Hep A, because like they just had a birthday and they're A, they're one, you know. You should just know Hep A you're going to have to give two times. So usually people give it at 12 months and then again at 18 months. Four to six years, you're going to be giving four vaccines. So I have to remember that is four. So then you can just remember Tdap, polio, MMR, and varicella. Antimicrobials. So they're broken down into classes. For the NCLEX, you don't have to know which one belongs to which class, but it's helpful to remember it in the classes that you'll remember the side effects because they all cause different side effects based on the class. So we're going to start with the first one, aminoglycosides. They all end in mycin, so either with a Y or an I, streptomycin, gentamicin. A hint to remember this is mycin, like m mouse, and amino is like mean, so the mean people are really nasty to like the quiet mouse people. Side effects are ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. So you want to monitor the BUN, creandum, and the trough level. The NCLEX likes to test you on ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity, especially with antimicrobials. Okay, the next one is cephalosporin, so they all start in ceph, so that's easy, cephalexin, and cephalor. You should know that they have a core sensitivity to penicillin, so if someone is allergic to penicillin, you do not want to give them a cephalosporin. The next one is fluoroquinolone, so those include ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin, so they both have the same ending. This one is macrolide, so those include azithromycin and erythromycin, so those all end in mycin, so you can think of the mouse again, and the macro big person who's hitting on the tiny little mouse. You want to give it with meals, and you want to give it if someone's allergic to penicillin, you're going to give them this instead. The next one is nitrofuratoin. What you want to know with this one is that the urine will have a brownish discoloration, and you don't want to give it to someone with renal failure. The next one is penicillin, and they all end in psyllin. So with these, you want to know that a lot of people are allergic to anaphylactic reaction, and they have a lot of hypersensitivities to it. So you want to ask them if they're allergic, and if they're allergic, the first question you want to ask is what happens. The next one is sulfamide, so they all start with sulfa. What you want to know with this is you want to drink 3 liters a day, you want to use a backup contraceptive, and you want to avoid the sun. The next one, tetracycline, so they all end in cycline, doxycycline. You want to drink 3 liters a day, use backup contraceptive, avoid sun exposure. The same thing as the sulfas, except for that you also want to be careful because it could cause tooth discoloration, especially with young children. And the last one is glycopeptide, which is vancomycin. Do not give it to someone who's allergic to corn. It also has ototoxicity, nephrotoxicity. Also, you want to give it over one hour. You want to prevent red man syndrome, which could be very dangerous, and you want to monitor the trough level. These are special classes of antimicrobials. 
So the first one is antifungal, and this includes fluconazole. So they all end in azole. An example of a fungal infection would be candidiasis. So you'd have to know like all these infections because if you have a question that says, what would you give for HIV? And then you think antifungal, but HIV is a viral infection, so you're going to give an antiviral. So you should kind of know where they fall into. Okay, it then goes anti-malaria, so that goes hydrochloroquine for malaria attacks, rheumatoid arthritis, or systemic lupus. The next one is anti-cortisol, which is metronidazole. For this one, you do not want to give alcohol while you're taking it, and up to 48 hours after, you don't want to have alcohol. So these are for diseases like trichomyelitis, C. diff, vaginosis, etc. Then goes anti-tuberculosis. These ones they like to test on. Okay, so isoniazide which is abbreviated INH and rifampin. For some reason, they love to test on this. Okay. So for latent TB, you're going to take INH for six to nine months. And for active TB, you're going to take multiple drugs for up to 12 months. So while you're taking these, consume foods that are high in vitamin B6, and you should not have tyramine foods, which is the same thing for MIOIs, which is antidepressants. And you have a risk for fentoin toxicity. So the tyramine foods and the risk for fentoin toxicity are specific for INH. And it's normal to see a discoloration of the urine, saliva, sweat, or tears with rifampin. And then goes antivirals, which all ends in vir, or cyclovir, cyclovir. And these are for the viral infections like dental herpes, shingles, HIV. And you want to begin these medications at the onset of the symptoms. Musculoskeletal medications. So these include biphosphonates, anti-rheumatics, DMARDs, glucocorticoids, NSAIDs, and anti-gout. Biphosphonates. These include, include alendronate, resindronate, they all end in dronate. A hint I remember this is 8, so when you think of like, let's say, osteoporosis, you tell everyone, eat your calcium or eat your vitamins, like that. Okay, it's used to treat or prevent osteoporosis for Pigott's disease or, or hypercalcemia. It's contraindicated in lactation, because think about the calcium, and difficulty swallowing. Some side effects are muscle pain, GI, esophagus discomfort, and for specifically the zolindronate, which is the only one given IV, jaw pain, and AFib. Other things you should consider is you want to give it in the morning on an empty stomach, you want patients to drink, remain upright for 30 minutes after taking, and eat vitamin D. anti -rheumatics. So these are for rheumatoid arthritis. So we're going to start off with the first class, DMART. So these include methyltrexate, hydrochloroquine, anthracyp, etc. So methyltrexate, you're not going to use it in pregnancy, and has an increased risk for infection. It could be used as a cancer drug also. So because you have an increased risk for infection, you're going to monitor signs of infection. And because you don't want to use it in pregnancy, you want to have a reliable contraceptive. Also, it takes three to six weeks for the initial effect. And the other medication is hydrochloroquine, and that has a side effect of retinal damage, so you're going to have an eye exam every six months. The next one is glucocorticoids, and these include prednisone, prednisolone, so O and then own, so they're steroids. Side effects are the same side effects like all steroids. They have increased risk for infection, hyperglycemia, hypokalemia, fluid retention, adrenal suppressant. You don't want to skip doses. You want to monitor the blood pressure, fluids and electrolytes, the weights. You never want to stop it abruptly, and you have at risk for infection. Just a side note, because DMARDs and steroids both have at risk for infection, you want to do infection precaution, like the same thing that you do for someone with cancer. No live vaccines, no fresh flowers, etc. Okay, then goes NSAIDs, so this includes ibuprofen, endomethacin, naproxen, and encelcoxib. These side effects have GI side effects, renal impairment, and photosensitivity. So you want to take it with food for dry side effects. You want to use sunscreen because it has photosensitivity. Like Olen said, the patient is at a higher risk for myocardial infarction and stroke. Anti-gout. So these include colchicine and allopurinol. So colchicine is for acute gout attacks and allopurinol is for chronic gout. It's contraindicated with patients with renal or cardiac or GI dysfunction and do not take it with theophylline. Side effects are GI distress, rash or fever. If you do get a rash or fever, you want to discontinue it and decrease metabolism of work. Okay, other stuff, you want to avoid foods high in purines, like seafood and meat, etc. And you want to monitor the CBC and the uric acid level, and you want to avoid aspirin, you want to take it with meals. So that's it for this video. Stay tuned for the next one, part 4D, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and like this video. Thank you.